Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Westendorf, part of the Community Relations Team at the Deschutes Public Library. As part of our exploration of the 1970s, today's program is the Peace Movement and Social Justice with Dr. Robert Gould. Rob is a lifelong resident of Portland, Oregon. He co-founded Portland State University's graduate program in conflict resolution in 1993 and served as its director until 2015. He also served a three-year term as chair of PSU's philosophy department. He's presented a wide variety of papers, workshops, seminars, and topics related to philosophy and conflict resolution, including peace education, informal logic, ethics, and hate studies. In 1984, he co-founded the Oregon Peace Institute, and more recently, he co-founded the Northwest Institute for Conflict Resolution, the Peace and Conflict Studies Consortium, and the Newhall Nonviolence Institute. Thank you for covering this pertinent topic, Rob. Okay, so um, this presentation is about the culture war. And my uh, position here is that the culture war comes to of age in the 1970s. And since this uh, presentation is about the 1970s, uh, as well as sort of the peace movement, uh, I'm kind of focusing on the culture war because that seems to be uh, one of the things we're struggling with today, but we've struggled with this for quite a long time. So who am I? Uh, I'm a res lifelong resident, as, uh, as, you know, as Laurel mentioned, of Portland, and I've lived in Eugene and now currently live in Lake Oswego, just outside of Portland. Uh, I'm a descendant of Robert Beam Gould, who is my grandfather and the former Deschutes County surveyor. And I've actually heard from the current uh, this year's county surveyor that he did a, a terrific job of, uh, of basically surveying the original air, area for Bend. Um, I'm the son of uh, Robert Jarvis Gould, MD, and uh, the nephew of Philip Gould, who worked with uh, his whole entire career at the Lumberman's Insurance Company in Bend. Um, my specializations are in uh, philosophy, history, ethics, and peace studies. I've just completed a book on uh, navigating difference, conflict resolution, values, and ethics. And during the 1970s, I was 21 years old, and at the end of that decade, I was 31. During that decade, I worked as a draft military veterans counselor at the Portland State University Campus Christian Ministry. And every summer and some winters, my family rake vacations at Sun River. I regularly race in the Pacific Crest weekend events. Last year, I won my age group. Uh, in the duathlon because I was the only person in that age group. Uh, we love the band area and love visiting there. Um, the culture war, the term was originally uh, originated in uh, uh, 19th century Germany and referred to conflicts between rich religious groups. Uh, it became a popular term in the United States with the publication of James Hunter's book, Culture Wars, The Struggle to Define America. Uh, American cultural war is usually considered to be a conflict between traditionalists or conservatives versus uh, progressives and liberals. Or you can think of it as Americans who believe the United States is essentially a Christian country of European settlers and their descendants. Uh, the other conception is that America is a diverse country with many beliefs or values. So there's several hot button issues that constitute the broader culture war. Uh, the list is ever expanding. The newest member of that list, I think, is uh, that there are people who think that their individual freedom is uh, being abridged by being forced to wear um, a mask in this pandemic. And the other side of that is that it's a public responsibility to uh, keep the epidemic under control and to de-escalate it by wearing masks. So. Um, First on the list here is the militarized police versus community policing. On the one side, uh, the military has given equipment to the police to uh, make them more sophisticated in their policing, and, and they feel that the military model is successful in doing a better job of policing. policing. On the other side, the community policing tries to bring uh, community safety down to the individual neighborhood where people know each other. Second here is civil rights for all historically oppressed groups versus no special entitlements. Um, so again, 
the way this issue is perceived is that uh, there's a conception that everyone is free and everyone should have the same rights and uh, entitlements. Uh, and so that's the more conservative view. Uh, the more liberal view is that there needs to be expanded civil rights for all historically oppressed groups. And again, the Black Lives Matter and the uh, police uh, killings have uh, obviously made a big, uh, you know, a big media uh, event here uh, most recently. And the opinions are swinging wildly uh, too on that. Um, so that's kind of what we're living through at the moment. Um, another issue is affirmative action for again, all historically oppressed groups versus no special entitlement. So it's the same kind of tension. You know, affirmative action assumes that people need to have a leg up uh, that they haven't been able to get without it. Uh, and the other side says everybody is you know, pretty much equal here. They just have to work hard for their success. Uh, this, the next one is Native American treaty rights, which gives Native Americans certain uh, rights over the areas reserved to them uh, and certain advantages uh, in being able to offer casinos. So then other, the other side says, well, why are we giving any special entitlements to that group? Um, the next thing is sort of free public services, education and healthcare versus the privatization of a lot of public uh, agencies that have got along for a long time. I should just say a kind of a personal note, my father was the medical director of Multnomah County Hospital up here in Portland. And that was a hospital that was dedicated to low income people. So everything in the healthcare range was free. In fact, I was born in that hospital. So, you know, I was born with the public paying for it. So, uh, the other side of that is that all these services should be private, privatized because they'll be more efficient and the profit motive will make them more streamlined. Uh, one side here of the abortion argument is that it should be criminalized. The other side is it should be illegal and people should be free to choose uh, that option. Again, with gun control, the one side feels that the access to guns has gotten too extreme and we've had a lot of horrific uh, mass shootings and we need to control and manage that. Uh, so again, gun safety is another way of talking about that side versus gun rights. If people have a right to have uh, the guns they want and feel like they need. Next is open immigration versus restricted immigration. Um, some people want more open immigration, some people want it more restricted. Just with the lifestyle, some people want to look uh, the way they want to look, and some people feel like they should look as the way they're supposed to look. So again, there's uh, traditional ways that people are expected to look and dress, and uh, then there are non-traditional ways that people feel like they're dialing in their individuality. Recreational drugs on the one side wants to make them legal, the other side wants to make them illegal. Uh, wealth accumulation on one side, the free market uh, should be able to, you know, accommodate people who uh, can generate as much wealth as possible and those people in general will then benefit society by uh, creating consumer goods and uh, you know, often, oftentimes a certain kind of uh, uh, benefactor uh, gifts whereas the other side wants to tax the rich and support public benefits. Um, one side here is believing in individual freedom is the most important thing for everybody. Uh, we should be able to live the way we want and with the least amount of government interference. Uh, and the other side uh, is the public responsibility of people who feel respons responsible to make things more fair in society and to make uh, services accessible and housing accessible to everyone. The next one is uh, that we should we keep the hierarchies as steep as we want to. Uh, bigger and bigger corporations require steeper and steeper hierarchies. Um, on the other side, people want to flatten those hierarchies. They feel like the being you know, at the bottom of a pecking order is pretty difficult. Uh, and if you have a boss that you really can't get along with, that would be better to have a way to talk to your union representative and. Uh, form a grievance against that particular person. 
Um, so again, strong unions are important to people uh, to have some benefits from that. And on the other side, people feel like the unions don't give us enough benefits and they should be free, the company should be free to develop as it wishes. Um, we've had the increase of gig work, part-time work, uh, which has fit some people's lifestyles, but on the other hand, uh, can be very insecure and the traditional work has more benefits because it's connected to unions oftentimes um, and uh, will give more security. So the next uh, conflict is between globalism and nationalism. On the one hand, you have people feeling like the, 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 the global trade and, and global uh, agreements are good for everyone. And on the other side, nationalism is more like, well, what's good for the, our country is really what we should be looking out for and not paying so much attention to what's good for other people. Um, next one is around environmental protection. Some people want very strong ones concerning the global climate change and, and sort of just um, maintain you know, the diversity of species, which is important. Uh, for us and our own future, as well as uh, making our natural surroundings strong. And some people believe that, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is nice, but it shouldn't get in the way of free enterprise. Um, proper, private property rights are sometimes contrasted to public reserves. So we have the occupation out of Mal here, and Eastern Oregon is an example of uh, how people are, uh, don't like to have uh, so many, you know, so much acreage and uh, controlled by the federal government. Uh, they'd rather have that in their private property uh, so they can use it for grazing. In terms of justice, you know, there's punitive justice with warehousing people in jails and prisons versus uh, restorative justice, figuring out ways to people to uh, work in a restorative process when it's a crime that the victim is uh, somehow uh, given some rest restoration, some commitment. Uh, from the person who's the perpetrator. Um, and that's, there's other ways to conceive of a restorative justice, but it's a way of, of kind of bringing people back into society in a positive way. Um, one side of the next one is the militarization of foreign and domestic policy versus the demilitarization of policies. Uh, so, you know, we have the world's largest military uh, Prior to World War II, we were the 16th below Portugal. So after World War II, uh, we became sort of the world's empire and we need to defend it with a heavy military, militarized foreign policy. Uh, and the other side just believes that we should demilitarize and we, we're in a day and age of global cooperation and we don't need to have uh, the military be in, in so many countries. There's literally uh, over hundred countries that we have military installations. Um, one side here is separation of church and state versus American as a Christian nation. So, you know, when obviously those are quite different conceptions. Next, we have the, the accurate news versus fake news. And so, uh, depending on what channel you watch, uh, which you're loyal to, then that becomes the accurate news and the other one becomes the fake news if they don't agree on things. Um, the next contrast is between powerful voices, voices being heard. Um, you know, the media always focuses in on celebrities, people with power and powerful ops. The rest of us are pretty powerless. We don't uh, generally not very well heard. So, you know, we have protests where people get heard more, but sometimes that's only temporary. So those are the hot button issues that I've picked. Again, there's more. Uh, and and uh, so I want to have a a little bit of talk about how to de-escalate. So the whole point of conflict resolution in uh, these uh, conflicts is that there are ways to de-escalate these issues. So, um, so let me explain what I think about that. So um, just the, the fact is, is that if you bump into these hot button issues with somebody you're talking to, they, the conversation can become quite volatile and stressful. Uh, that just happens because people can have very strong opinions. Now, my mother was a conflict avoider. She was never worried about cultural war uh, happening around her because she just simply adapted to the people she was with. And she took on the, uh, you know, the uh, views of, the, of her friends. 
So uh, once uh, she died in 1989, actually, but prior to that, I had a conversation with her and I asked her, I said, what if it turns out, see my views, her friends had you know, very conservative traditional views and my friends you know, had a different views, more on the other side. And so I asked her, what if it turns out in the long run, you know, my views turn out to be more accurate or more beneficial for the society and the world than yours? And she said to me that, well, that's possible. It really is possible your views might turn out that way, but I wouldn't want to change my views because then I'd lose my friends. So I think that speaks volumes for people who value friendship more than uh, being real thoughtful about the issues that come up amongst friends. Um, my mother is quite smart and a very wonderful person, but I think that's kind of what pe the trade out people make if they you know, want to have a wide group of friends, a pretty tight group of friends. Um, personally, on a good day, I enjoy people with different points of view and I'm generally curious about the experiences that led to their beliefs, uh, regardless of what those beliefs are. I am actually against brutal evil. Uh, that's something that I won't tolerate, but I actually think that uh, when you talk to people who have different views on those hot button issues, they've had experiences which inform those views. And so that's where those views kind of come from. It's usually not them just my friend thought of this, you know, they actually have some firsthand experience. So that's the thing that I want to know about. And uh, people live where their experiences have taken them. So talking about that is one way uh, to avoid a battle. Now, what my goal here is, is to open up a space where we can navigate the continuum between polar opposites on, of a given issue. So I've just given you a lot of polar opposites, but actually those, that's kind of misleading. So the point of this slide really is to say that the whole culture war depends on polar opposites and depends on people taking one view or the other view. When actually on any of those views, we're probably someplace in between on a continuum. Uh, and we might move around a little bit, depending on what ex the exact issue is. Uh, you know, uh, the protests uh, at first were uh, kind of mired uh, publicly with uh, some violence. But actually, the way that that's being perceived, and I think the way that it actually is, and the media has done a good job of showing that it's, there's the protesters who are nonviolent, and then there's some people who come in to try to hijack the protests for their own purposes whether it's looting or violence. Uh, and that seems to be how the, you know, the polls are showing, that seems to be how it's perceived. So, you know, that's, that's a good thing, I think, because, uh, you know, nonviolent protest is part of our constitutional rights and it's an important thing to defend. So, uh, so that's just an example that, you know, obviously, you know, those of us who care for peace don't want to see violence in the demonstrations. And we, you know, a friend of mine has organized a whole group of people who wear, orange vests uh, who are peacekeepers and really try to de-escalate any kind of violence when it starts. And they've been very successful at doing that. So again, th the idea is to have a conversation with people that are different and then you want to soften the divides between you to understand, you know, what the other person is saying and, uh, you know, to contribute your own beliefs uh, and kind of talk about your own experiences. So that sort of softens these divides. Probably a uh, few people are on one extreme end of the culture war. We are all on a continuum between polarities, depending on the circumstance. The overall priorities in America tend to be between uh, public, public, excuse me, private property, individual freedom versus uh, public responsibility and security. But let's say, I mean, I think, I don't think I've ever met anybody who wants to deny one side of that or the other side. You know, the values of individual freedom and private property are part of what this country is all about and public responsibility and security is too. So it's a matter of trying to find a balance between those two and everybody kind of thinks about that in different ways. Uh, the second thing is there's a singular American traditions versus diverse values and practices. Now the singular American traditions are enshrined in the constitution. We're supposed to think these are the traditions that are going to form the the government are just going to rule and uh, frame how we think about our society in general. 
But on the other hand, uh, diverse values and practices should be able to fit into that. You know, it should be a, a, a kind of the United States was formed uh, to be able to absorb diverse values and practices. We had immigrants from a lot of different countries. We've got a Native American population. Uh, we've got emancipated slaves. We've got people who have different values and practices. So even though those polarities, uh, people will sometimes you know, emphasize one over the other. But I guess what I'm saying is the conflict resolvers, we really both agree to a certain extent in both of those. And there's ways that we have commonalities as Americans. Um, the, the term culture war makes it seem violent. Uh, when it's rarely violent, really, the, the culture war itself is not a violent. It's mostly just uh, people disagreeing with each other. Uh, and it doesn't require violence. Uh, so it's an eye-grabbing term, and, uh, but again, it's overly polarized and confrontational. The Cultural War in America started when Christopher Columbus landed on an island off our shores. Uh, and it follows a trail of descent throughout history, our history. And I say that because Christopher Columbus was actually documented to be a very brutal man uh, who enslaved uh, Native Americans and brutalized them as well. Now that happened because there was a priest on board his ship who took notes and was outraged by Christopher Columbus. So uh, there already was a, a dis dissident person uh, in, on board uh, Christopher Columbus. So uh, we have a tradition of celebrating Christopher Columbus, you know, as the new, the, kind of the discovery of a new land, okay? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there were people living here. There were millions of people living here uh, who thought it was their country too. So the descent happened over the years. Uh, you can trace it back particularly in Greenwich Village in New York City when there was, uh, you know, there was, there was African Americans who were um, enslaved and were in semi-slavery actually uh, that we used as a buffer against the Native Americans on Manhattan. In that area, the buffer is now Greenwich Village, but over the years there's been uh, a number of different peoples who have lived there because there was ways, because kind of the first multicultural community was formed sort of a, a, dis, a dissident view about uh, the dominant culture. But it took till the 1970s, till the sort of long history of dissent became powerful, a powerful political force that actually informs the political landscape today. So the 70s were really a turning point uh, where it went from just being dissent of individuals or small groups or maybe certain ethnic groups or race groups who you know, were dissident to the, the general values of the country. But now it's become a uh, political force. Uh, Republicans tend to be allied with traditionalists and Democrats tend to be allied with progressives. But again, this is sort of a false split. I've got friends who are Republicans, friends who are Democrats. Uh, I, I've got friends who are dogmatic Democrats and hard to talk to, and I've got friends who are dogmatic Republicans and hard to talk to. But on the other hand, I have open-minded Democrats and open-minded Republicans and they're easy to talk to about controversial issues. So, uh, and they fall all across the spectrum. So again, it's, it's not as black and white as it seems. Polarization of American politics is escalating uh, just this last week. Um, again, at least 100 law enforcement agencies, many large cities use some form of tear gas against civilians protesting police brutality and racism. Uh, also, the Supreme Court affirmed the rights of dreamers and LGBTQ rights. So these things, you know, are happening right now. So I want to go through uh, events in the 1970s, which sort of put uh, dissent sort of on the mainstream uh, of politics and, um, and again began to be a, a very, very strong force in the culture. So overall, America whips, whips on here from President Johnson's uh, 1960s liberal great society to, to Nixon, who was uh, elected in 1968, to, he had a conservative backlash. It was the, the uh, silent majority that he 
uh, considered to be uh, in the conservative realm, and they agreed and elected him. Uh, so the silence was that they were not protesting the, the society. So then it went back left when President Carty was, uh, he was elected at the end of that decade. And he was a champion of peace and the environment. So in 1970, a, a good, very controversial thing happened when President Nixon ordered the invasion of Cambodia, widening the Vietnam War. Uh, massive protests emerged across the United States. Four students were killed at Kent State University. Two were killed at Mississippi State. Uh, so there was a police riot at Portland State University. It was injured uh, several students. There was an occupation of the park blocks, and then police came in swinging billy cubs. 1971, the Supreme Court uh, ruled unanimously that busing students who achieved desegregation is constitutionally supported. So this was part of the desegregation of the South. 1971, 12,000 protesters were arrested at Washington, D.C., occupation against the Vietnam War. I was there and I was arrested. 1971, Attica prison uprising, 33 uh, prisoners were killed in that uh, uprising and 10 guards were killed. 1972, over 1,900 1,900 domestic bombings happened in the United States, and that's from an FBI, retired FBI agent. That's a lot of bombings. Uh, organizations like the Weather Underground uh, claimed responsibility for some of those, and there was a, a African Liberation Army was involved in others. Watergate uh, break-ins occurred in 1972, which eventually led to Nixon's resignation. 1972, the Equal Rights Amendment passed the Congress, but it's still not been completely ratified. 1973, the U.S. P, uh, signs peace agreement with uh, Vietnam and begins to pull out troops. Uh, Roe versus Wade legalizes abortion, and the cell phone was invented. Uh, 1974, Patricia Hearst is con con uh, kidnapped by the Symbionese Liberation Army. Again, it's part of these militant groups, um, like the Black Panthers sort of evolved into the African uh, uh, Resistance Army and uh, Symbionese Liberation Army uh, was an interesting amalgam of uh, college students and uh, a former prisoner. Um, very controversial how that started. I. Uh, I knew people who knew people in the Symbionese Liberation Army and who were very intelligent University of California, Berkeley students. Um, and he was as surprised as I was that this whole thing uh, unfolded as it is in quite a violent way. The Vietnam War officially ends in 1975. Microsoft was founded in 1975 and the first personal computer becomes widely available. 1976, Jimmy Carter is elected. Uh, the country swings left, and Apple was founded. 1976, the uh, Supreme Court affirms support for the death penalty. 1977, Stephen Biko, an anti-apartheid activist, was murdered by police. And again, that's something that affects this country a lot. Uh, in some ways, uh, South Africa has, has mirrored uh, the slavery in the United States. Uh, the kind of separate development that it was really imposed on black people. Um, Trevor Noah, the late night comedian, is from South Africa, written a wonderful book called Born a Crime. Uh, he's a very sophisticated thinker and, uh, and an excellent comedian too, so I always recommend people listen to him. Um, 1977, a nuclear proliferation treaty uh, to stop nuclear weapons spread was approved. 1978, property tax limitation in California, which cut uh, tax bills by 60% and threw public services into an array. These tax limitation uh, bills have been passed around the country and in Oregon as well. And so the state budgets have been very hard to, uh, to meet all of their expenses. Uh, 1978, the cult leader Jim Jones uh, had 909 followers commit suicide in his reserve in Africa. Uh, and uh, one of the alumni of our program, Sister, 
was in that suicide and died there. 1979, Three Mile Island uh, nuclear power plant almost melts down. So that's the end of the slideshow. Um, I, uh, you know, again, want to remind you of what the takeaways for this would be. And that is that when you're having a conversation on a controversial issue, again, listen to uh, what, uh, and, be, and be curious about the experiences that led people to the beliefs that they have. Um, and if that sort of curiosity and listening or the two cute, two things that conflict resolvers use to keep things from in, getting inflamed in the conversation. So I recommend that you do that. And that you try to see that uh, these are not extreme polarities, that we fall on continuums, that really depends on a lot of variables and, and contextual information. So trying to be sensitive to not <laughs> making this a culture war, but just thinking this is, is culture difference. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rob. I don't know that I've ever seen a list like that of all the hot button issues together, um, quite like that. And it feels, at first it started to feel really insurmountable when you started to go over that, like how to bridge that gap. Um, but then the more I thought about it, it's like, yeah, all of it, everything really is on a more of a scale um, than an either or. Uh, I was curious if you had any other resources for people that are interested in learning more about conflict resolution and how to become a conflict resolver. Uh, well, at Portland State, um, I helped found uh, our graduate program in conflict resolution. And over the years, we added on uh, a major and a minor. And we've also uh, have undergraduate certificates and then graduate certificates too. So we have a lot of ways of accessing that as in the formal education. Um, there, every, uh, every, every uh, major city in Oregon has uh, a conflict resolution program. And so I'm sure Bandit's got one too. I don't know exactly where it is. But I'm sure it's it's there, and so there's uh, if you contact those folks, they have trainings uh, about conflict resolution and de-escalation. Uh, so there's there's ways that you can access that in your local community. Mm. Okay, good. Well, I should also add that that the <laughs> the list is daunting even for me. You know, after I wrote the list, I got go, oh my God, how can I have a conversation with anybody about without getting running a foul of these somewhere, you know? And I, I have to say, you know, I have, a, I mean, I have, a, I have strong opinions about stuff. Uh, and, and, uh, and so sometimes I'll just let something slip out, you know? And, and sometimes it'll just be something uh, that's surprising. I mean, I, I've got a, a friends that are very conservative and wonderful, wonderful people, former neighbors. And uh, we, we really care a lot about them. We you know, socialize off and on. And uh, at this one event, you know, I was just talking, somehow the subject of uh, gender neutral bathrooms came up, which, which I thought was probably one of the least controversial issues, you know, really. Uh, I mean, that's my naivete, I totally own that. Uh, and so I was just, you know, kind of saying that at Portland State, that's kind of a no big deal. We're just slowly transitioning to gender neutral bathrooms or whatever we can. And, uh, and boy, it really, really struck that person as a volatile thing to do that. Really, it really erupted that, you know, there's people, people's gender should follow their, the sex they're born with. And if you're doing something else, it's just crazy, you know. And so I, you know, I, I was so shocked because they've been so open-minded about you know, a whole lot of issues we talked about. You know, I, I climbed a mountain with uh, one of the individuals and uh, had a great time. And uh, so, so you never can tell when you're going to stumble into something. And, and the sad thing is when you do, you kind of get labeled as one of those people, you know, mm -hmm. which, is, which is kind of sad. I, I think that, pe that people tend to be uh, like to be around people with similar beliefs. 
Uh, and I think that's a, that's a danger on both sides of the political spectrum. Is it just, I just don't, you know, yeah, I used to like them. And I think social media kind of organizes your Facebook site, you know, it's, it's so that you end up talking to people who have the same kind of beliefs. And if, and I've noticed that one of my, one of my good friends kind of researched me, I think on Facebook, <laughs> and then just kind of out of nowhere at, at dinner said, well, you know, Rob and I have completely different beliefs, you know, I already knew it. we'd done an inventory <laughs> about it, but you can kind of see, you know, if you follow people's Facebook posts, what, what they, what they think. So I, I, I uh, so these are the challenges, they're, they're there. But I think having a kind of a sense of humor about it was always going to be helpful, not taking yourself too seriously. Yeah, do you, did you find that even when the conversation like flows into that moment of tension, are you able to bring it back? You know, it, sometimes, let's be honest with you, sometimes yes, yeah, sometimes no. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if there's drinking involved, it's, it's going to be a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on how people you know tolerate alcohol, but uh, I, I you, you, you just you just don't know because there can be again. It's, I always think it's important. It's not what people say; it's what it's the experiences that drive what they're saying, right? Mm -hmm. And so, if you can't actually reach into their lives to find out those experiences, then you really don't know why they're reacting. It could mm -hmm. be somebody in the family that is, you know, uh, that, that maybe thinks they might be gay. You know, and and pe people in a traditional family might really be struggling with how to accept a gay kid, mm -hmm. let's say. And if you know, and sometimes they don't want to talk about that, but uh, that could be going on. These are the issue that I was talking about. Um, you just don't know, so you just have to fumble your way through life, you know, and, and make the best of it. And you know, I think I think I I have an advantage. For some reason, I really like people. And uh, and I can I can understand why some people are kind of like I I know I know a former congressperson who's you know retired now and and that person really confided to me that they really don't like people that much you know they've, they've they had such a rough time in their career in Congress and got so disillusioned you know by the whole process so uh, you can you can get kind of embittered you know you, you can have that experience but somehow I'm my 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 father. I, really like people I think I just caught it from him so when you like people then that's a way you wear every time you see something that you could disagree with you can still you know joke around and, and you know be curious about their life and you can kind of get through some of that so I'm always hopeful about people you know being able to soften these divides and you know so we'll see how it goes yeah I mean I I do recognize that today is very polarized um, and a lot of the people in everyone's friend group does is in a bubble you're surrounded by a bubble and I'm curious like did the 1970s feel like it was as much of a bubble or was it a little bit more vague does it feel similar well <laughs> well I'll be blunt with you I, I personally was much more dogmatic in the 70s I was a very black and white thinker and uh, my sister, who's more conservative, actually told me that, and she was right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't, didn't think of myself that way, but she was right. And uh, so, so I think that, you know, uh, we still live in an era where people can be dogmatic. Uh, and then you're right, if, there's, if you have a bubble of your friends and, and people you like, and it may be a real diverse bubble, but, uh, but it's, they're diverse, let's say, in, in ethnic or racial backgrounds, or gender, all that, and uh, gender orientation. They can be diverse in that way, but they still think exactly the same. Uh, and, and that's what's tough. I mean, I've, uh, I've had conservative students at Portland State who felt really beat up. And I felt like I was their ally, you know, because I thought, you know, they're decent people, you know, and they have just to have a different background and a different you know, way of thinking about things. And they felt like they were yelled at by other people, you know. And so, whereas I'm kind, I'm on the sort of left wing side, but I, I have compassion for anybody who feels like they can't say things without getting a you know, really negative, hostile reaction. Mm. Yeah, it, 
It's interesting. Like ultimately, it sounds like trying to find the common ground is what will make us stronger. Is kind of what I'm hearing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to say, you're absolutely right. Uh, where I get my real enthusiasm is with the uh, students in our conflict resolution program, uh, because they're, you know, where I was dogmatic and unsophisticated at their age, you know, twenties and thirties. They're not, <laughs> you know, they, they're right with the program. They know how to think across these borders and they know how to facilitate conversations across these borders. And I am incredibly inspired by them and impressed. And so that's to me the, the hopeful sign. <laughs> the, only, the only downside of that is everybody's going to think they're oddballs. You know, what do you believe, you know? <laughs> you know? But uh, so, the, so the real, I think the real dance is you have to dance is that, you know, have these beliefs and still be open to consideration and uh, other people's beliefs. And, and again, to dig into the experience that drive those beliefs and trying to figure out, you know, how we can live together without so much tension and how, and how we, can, uh, we can build a society that's, that's tolerant of, of, of a wide range of viewpoints on, on controversial issues. So I, I think we're gonna get there. I, I, I'm always very uh, hopeful, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, it, it is nice to look at a historical stance though and see right now, especially in the in context of what's gone on since the 70s and how it feels like there's a whiplash now, but it is so reflective of what's already been going on for so long. Yeah, and, and I have to say that, uh, you know, the 70s were a violent decade and a lot of the protests were violent, you know, uh, rock throwing and protests, you know, was pretty easy to trigger. Uh, and, uh, and there was these bombings, right? You know, there was uh, somebody uh, packed explosives in the Liberty Bell underneath the city council in Portland and blew the bell right up through the, the council chambers, right? There were two army recruiting stations that were blown up uh, in Portland. But again, as I said, the statistics are incredible that, that so many of those things happen. So, so I really think there's been a, a, a very strong swing towards nonviolent protests. And, uh, you know, Joey Gibson, who's, uh, you know, the Patriot Pair guy uh, who organizes a lot, a lot of these uh, conservative protests, I mean, he was, he, he visited one of these things, uh, demonstrations about police brutality and said, yeah, I'm against police, police, police brutality too, you know? And one of our faculty members had talked to him at length uh, to kind of build bridges, you know, to, to the other side. And you, we might be surprised, you know, with the, the kind of common ground you can have with, with people. And so that's, that's where we have to kind of rebuild America. Hmm. Well, I think that's, a great note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you, Rob.